Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get started, and I'll kick us off in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, just for your presence in our lives today. Lord, I just pray that we will continue to serve you with passion and uh, just listen to, to, to ways throughout our lives that you're constantly speaking to us and uh, encouraging us to, to just step out and be bold in our faith. And I pray that we can do that uh, more and more each and every day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, everybody Everybody, have a good week. Who's who's enjoying this nice weather? Anybody enjoying that? Yeah. Woo! Got to look at your closet this morning and go, I'm going to wear a jacket or a long sleeve shirt today. Haven't done that in a long time. So, okay, got a question for you. Before we uh, start, we've got a five-minute video, right, Doug? That will start here in a, in a few seconds. How many, what struck me this morning, hearing what was being said about the bank room, is raise your hand if you uh, were a member of the church back in Fairview. Okay, raise your hand. Look at that. Look around. Okay, look around and see the. Thank you. Okay, let's give them. Let's give them a hand. Okay. So thank you for everybody here and over here that raised their hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, Scott. You were his, you were his teacher. Okay, I heard that. Yeah. But uh, man, if it wasn't if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be here today. I mean, that just brings it home, brings makes it real. So, thank you for all that, Doug. Let's go ahead and uh, kick that off, and we'll get started. Hey, Cottonwood Creek Church family, I just want to take some time to walk you through our Make Room campaign. Here's the first aspect of our Make Room campaign. It's additional seats in the worship center. We're going to add 825 seats to our worship center, add that to the 1,825 current seats we have. So eventually, after we've added the new seats, we will have the ability to worship 2,650 people in our worship center. Now, also as a part of the Make Room campaign, we're going to make some campus changes to make it easier for people to get on and off our campus as we continue to reach the next person through the door. As you look at the map, first of all, uh, the first part is a new ingress-egress point from the south side uh, of our parking lot to Ridgeview. It's going to be right here. We're going to start that uh, this year, and we're so looking forward to that. Then you'll notice new parking that is right back here in the south. We're going to start that. Uh, before the end of the year as well. But eventually we want to have an exit that takes us out to Stacy Road. And next is a part of this Make Room campaign. Uh, let's move back to the building. First of all, more restrooms. And so you'll notice that we are phase one right here, about to get started just as soon as we can get these drawn up and get through the city. Uh, more restrooms just out of the south side of the worship center. This will more than double our current worship center bathroom space. And so we desperately need that. Also notice as a part of this, a brand new atrium that will take us all the way out to the western parking lot. So if you park in the west parking lot you can get into the building right here if you're going to go straight into the worship center you can actually walk straight into this worship center so it gives us a third ingress egress point to get into worship which again reduces some of the crowding then next notice we have a brand new student space right here now this new student space is going to seat up to 500 kids then beyond that, for the students, there's going to be plenty of technology in that room. Uh, there will be movable glass so people and students can move from the uh, sand volleyball courts out to our uh, welcome areas and our courtyard space outside right into our student space. And it's going to be absolutely beautiful. So next, let me show you our ministry support building right up here. And so we currently have our staff. Uh, spread all over the building. But when we ultimately add this new administration building, it's going to bring all of our staff together. If you'll notice right here, this is where our current administration office is. This is where my uh, pastor's office is, and many of the other places. But now what we're going to have when we move all of our staff into one place, here's what it does for us. It creates four great life group rooms, probably for senior adults, and uh, that allows them easy access without having to go up and down the stairs or use the elevator to be right here. So now let's go back and look at some uh, better images of 
what some of these things will look like. Let's start with the student center. Notice as you look at the student center, here it is, uh, another ingress, egress point into our atrium. Notice a large courtyard. Notice you see, uh, looking into the student space, uh, the glass doors that can open up, allow our students to move in and out freely. But here it is inside the student space. Man, the interior of the student space, notice the wonderful LED wall uh, that will have controlled natural lighting. Now, as we think about entering through the new West entrance, let me show you what you're gonna see. We walk in, if I wanted to, we've already passed this, but I could turn and go straight into the worship center to my left. But if I continue on around the atrium, notice we have our student building right there. So if you have students, they would just turn and go right in there and have a great day of worship or Bible study or whatever it is. Then I can continue to walk all the way around inside the atrium to get to my life groups, to go serve in my place, whatever it is. And if there's inclement weather, I am in the building immediately, which is a great thing. So here's my encouragement to you. Man, come to church every week. Be a part of worship. Man, battle the parking, battle the ingress, egress. Be a part of worship, and let's celebrate all that God has done. Beyond that, let me encourage you to commit to pray about your commitment. What would God do through you? And when we all come together as a church, here's what I truly believe. We will make room. I know it shouldn't be this way, but... A lot of times we roll our eyes when the church starts talking about raising money. But this is such an opportunity to advance the kingdom of heaven. And we need to be, we need to be all in on it. Um, when you look at the state of the world today and what's going on, what's going on in Israel, and I don't say this to be funny, but if something happens, and the mosque on Temple Mount blows up, I'm packing my bag and sitting in the backyard because, folks, it's getting ready to happen. So like John Mark did during worship service, we do need to pray for the people of Israel. Uh, this isn't going to end overnight. This is going to be a long, drawn-out affair. So, I love football, and I love relaxing. Because for me, relaxing always includes gold. The smokeless tobacco, just a pinch between my cheek and gum, gives me great tobacco taste. Without lighting up, got the sea, the breeze, got my skull, nothing's going to make me move. Think I'll play some touch. <laughs> skull, brother. Try going smokeless. A pinch is all it takes. brother. That is so awesome. I mean, there is no way you can do that today. I, I mean, that is so awesome. And for those of you that don't read my emails, I... Uh, I'm going to come back. There's a really spiritual point from that commercial that I that, that I'm going to make at the end of class. But I uh, I was a I was a tobacco user. I actually dip two cans a day. And yeah, I know. Pray for me. Yes, it was. I paid ninety nine cents a can um, and um, paid my way through school, but spent more on Copenhagen than I did on school books so um all right we are in joshua i actually let's go to um the list of books after we finish joshua we're going to go back to the new testament and he says two seconds pause so um I think everyone knows that we're verse by verse, book by book, and we have um, almost finished all of the New Testament. And so these are the books that we've gone through, and we're going to go back after we finish Joshua, and we're going to go to the book of Luke. Um, and then after Luke, we'll go to the Old Testament, and then we'll go through 1 Peter all the way through Jude and go back to Mark, and we will be completely done with the new testament but we'll keep going we'll 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 repeat and so um anyway we are in joshua 9 today so israel has come off two significant victories they have had a victory over jericho and they have had a victory over a town called ai and it was in two radically different ways one god actually knocked down the walls of jericho and Israel was successful in defeating 
Jericho, and secondly, in AI, they faltered, but then they ended up coming back and followed God's instructions all the way through. After that, they went to a place that had been pre-appointed by Moses in Deuteronomy to, in between, it was a massive amphitheater, basically, between two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And they set up an altar, and they wrote down all of the words of the book of the law. And it was so significant that they were basically honoring the word of God that the word of God was so important that they set up this altar and um, they honored that. And it's recorded. It's recorded for us. There are two themes today. They are back at Gilgal. They have, they have crossed the Jordan. They moved into the hill country. And now they're back at Gilgal, just right beside the Jordan River. And there's two themes, two themes. Number one, we're supposed to seek God's counsel. And number two, we're supposed to honor our covenants, even if you're married to a skull brother. And so let's kick off. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowlands all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes, and all their provisions were dry and crumbly. So there was a, uh, a governance structure in Israel. All of these cities were city-states. And so when it says kings, almost every single town was governed by its own king, and they were independent. And so they realize at this point that up against Israel, which may have had 600,000 fighting men, they're going to fall. And they can't independently fight Israel. And so these city-states, these kings come together and, and they said, okay, we've seen God destroy Jericho. We've seen how Israel destroyed AI. We can't, we can't possibly win unless we come together. And so they band together and the Gideonites, the, from Gideon, obviously, they basically say, okay, we're not going to do that. By the way, all of these ites, the, all of the Ites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, Termites, Pepsilites, Stalactites, they all are descendants of Canaan and are under the Canaan curse. And so God had, we, we've talked about this numerous times, God had cursed them even in the days of Abram. Even when he said you're going to be you're going to be in is you're going to be in Egypt for 400 years, he cursed these ites, and so they're all under the ites, all under the curse, and so they hear all of them hear that Jericho and AI. It says they'd heard of this. That's the last words in verse one. They heard what had happened in those two cities, and they gathered together to fight against one. Now, there's something really important. Let's go down to Deuteronomy, Doug. So God had given an instruction. He basically said, because these people are cursed, you need to wipe them out. If you come up against people that are not in Canaan, then you need to you need to give them an opportunity to serve you and not wipe them out. So in Deuteronomy 20.10, it says, when you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war with you, then you shall besiege it. 
And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all the males to the sword. Down in 15, thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far away outside the land of Canaan, outside the land of Israel, which are not in the cities of the nations here, but in the cities of the peoples that the Lord your God is giving to you for an inheritance, you shall save nothing alive, nothing that breathes. But you shall devote it to complete destruction, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, so that you will not sin against the Lord your God. If someone was outside of Canaan, they had an opportunity to serve Israel and not die. Somehow, these people from Gideon had heard. They had heard what had happened in Egypt. They had heard what had happened to Sihon and Og on the other side of the Jordan. They had heard what had happened at Jericho. And they're like, okay, we're going to die. We will be defeated. We can't win against these people. So we're going to dupe them. We're absolutely going to deceive them. So let's, let's go down to the... Um, to the map. So this is Gideon. You will, on the left map, you'll see that they're at Gilgal. Gideon is, Gideon is right beside Ai, just down to the left. You see Gideon? And then that is 12.2 miles from Gilgal. So they're going to come in, and they're going to say, all right, we're from a very distant land, and they're 12 miles from the camp at Israel. This is an actual city. I always want to show these real places because people tend to think that the Bible is fiction. This is a real city. There are um, archaeologists that are doing digs even today, and we'll come back to that. All right, let's go back up. And so, verse 3, it says, But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, now keep that in mind, they have heard what happened at Jericho and Ai. Just keep that in your mind. And they, on their part, acted with cunning. That word is the exact same, it's crafty is what it means, crafty, and it's the exact same word in Genesis 3, which is described of the serpent or Satan. This is, this is about deception. They acted with craftiness, and they went and made ready the provisions, and they took worn-out sacks, that sackcloth, for their donkeys, wineskins worn out, torn and mended, wineskins. So Jesus, if you remember in Luke, Jesus said you should not put old wineskins are not ready for new wine. So these, a wineskin, by the way, a wine, oh, awesome, perfect, well done. So a wineskin is actually skin. They would take an animal, an animal hide, and they would, they would obviously gut it, and it, they would sew up the legs, they would sew up the um, basic body part, and the neck, so we, we, we talk about bottlenecks. That was actually the neck of the wineskin. And so a wineskin needed to be new and needed to be able to expand because the fermenting process would bust, would bust the wineskin. And that's why Jesus said to the Pharisees that you can't put wine into old wineskins. And what he was saying is your Old Testament view your unaccommodating view is not going to meet my purpose. My purpose is expansive. And so they had these wineskins, and they basically duped them. They said that these are old. They had these old sackcloths. Look at those ancient sackcloths from Egypt, and then the ancient sandals. And so they, they dressed up in all of this stuff, and they show up literally to dupe Israel. And so they acted with cunning, 
They had all of the wineskins. They had patched sample, uh, sandals. And then they had these, the bread that was crumbly. And in some verses, it actually says moldy. And so they did all of this, all of this totally as a ruse. Everything about this is to dupe Israel. All right. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you live among us, then how can we make a covenant with you? Then they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And they said, from a very distant country, your servants have come because the name of the Lord, your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Asheroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say, we are your servants. Come now and make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day that we set out to come to you. But now behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out to the, from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. We're going to learn in a second that this is actually four cities and that the leaders are from Gibeon. Um, again, we see that Joshua is at the camp of Gilgal right beside the Jordan River. And they come and they say, oh, we're, some, we're from so far away, totally distant country. Let's just make a treaty. Let's have a covenant. And the people are suspect. They're like, maybe you're from right here. Why should we, why should we do a treaty with you? And they're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're your servants. And Israel's like, oh, it'd be nice to have some servants. Who wouldn't want a servant? How many people want a servant? They're like, oh, a servant. A servant may be okay. I missed, oh, <laughs> I'm so glad my wife's not here. We come from a distant country and we've heard about the name of your Lord, but this isn't, this isn't a Rahab moment. Rahab is repentant. Rahab says your God, he is the God. They're saying, We've just heard about your God. They're not converting. This is all about total deception. Now, I want you to see in verse 9, the end of verse 9, for we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites. He didn't say, they didn't say, we heard about what happened in Jericho and Ai. They said, we heard about this thing that happened 40 years earlier because they want to have the appearance of being from far away. They wouldn't have just heard of Jericho and AI. So they are totally in the deception mode and they're perfect. What a great husband this would be, right? And so because of the name of the Lord your God, we heard what he did in Egypt and to the two kings, Sion and Og, those, that is on the eastern side of the Jordan River before they, before they came. And down in verse 13, these wineskins were new when we filled them up and they burst. And so Israel, verse 14, so the men took some of the provisions, but they did not ask the counsel of God. So, deception. Um, one of the really puzzling stories in the Old Testament in Genesis comes with Rebekah and Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And Rebekah loves Jacob, 
Isaac is about to die. He's, he's almost blind, and he's about to die. And he tells Esau, okay, I'm going to give you my blessing, which is a double portion. I'm, gonna, I'm going to bless you. You'll receive all of these things. Go out and, and find game for me and cook it and prepare for me, and then I'll give you my blessing. Rebecca hears this, and Rebecca loves Jacob, and she's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. By the way, Esau means hairy. So she she puts goat hair on his hands and on the back of his neck. It's really important on the back of his neck. She gets Esau's clothes and puts it on him. And she is in total, she's in total dupe or mode. And she has him prepare game. And he, Isaac, is real. He is totally relying on his senses. He can't see. He doesn't really know what's going on, but he can hear. And all of a sudden, Jacob comes in and he says, I'm Esau, your son. I'm ready for your blessing. And he says, come close because the voice, the voice sounds like Jacob. So he can't see. He's relying on his hearing. And then he says, feel my skin, and he touches him. He relies on his touch, and then he pulls in. He says, let me have the meal. The meal is perfect, so he relies on his taste, and then he pulls him down, and he smells him. He smells the garments. He relies on his all five senses except his sight, all five, rather than seeking the counsel of God. And so the question is, does, does God use deception for his purposes? And my answer is no. God works his sovereign will. We, we tend to try to fix things for God, which is actually crazy. Isn't that crazy? Rebecca was trying to fix things for God because she thought Jacob was the appointed person. God would have done just fine without Rebecca. And deception is never, never the solution. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, if we can go down to that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your way straight. So their failure was not seeking the counsel of God. And I do that all the time. I tend to execute without seeking the counsel of God. And I'm going to bet there are many people in here that do the same thing. We are supposed to seek the counsel of God. And it's not always easy, right? The, God talks to us. God the way you seek the counsel, let's go down to the list. How does God speak to us today? Number one, he speaks to us through his word. We are supposed to be ingrained in the Bible, in God's word. Now, knowing the Bible, knowing God's precepts, knowing what's going to go on, does that mean that if you have a job opportunity in Pittsburgh, that you're going to be able to open up the Bible to Pittsburgh and say, this is where I'm supposed to be. No, right? But in terms of what is right and what is wrong and what is righteous and what is good, the Bible gives us those answers. Number two, a peace from the Holy Spirit. And this is mostly like for me. When I am engaged in something at work, dealing with problems, which I'm covered up with problems, I, I get a peace when I eventually gravitate to the right answer. And I, it's seeking God's wisdom, peace from the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 32, 17. And the effect of righteousness will be peace. When I decide, when I come to a place where I believe this is right, I have a peace that, I, that really does come from God. And the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust 
and I, I believe it comes from the Holy Spirit, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring you remem remembrance of all that I've said. The Holy Spirit is such a peace if you're making the right decisions. And then in prayer, we tend to think of prayer. So Philippians 4, 6 through 7 talks about bring Bring your supplications and your thanksgiving and make all of your requests known before God. But several of the verses I didn't talk about relate to us listening to God in prayer, having, having silence. Isaiah 55, 3 says, incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Listen to God. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. The fourth, God speaks to us through wise Christian counsel and preaching and teaching. And not every skull brother teacher is a wise teacher. And so you have to be discerning. I'm blessed. Carolyn is I'm so glad she's not here. She has so much discernment and wisdom. She is such a blessing to me. Thank God she didn't have discernment when I proposed. And and I totally duped her, and I, I win, and she can't get out of it now. But being with people who are wise is such a blessing. But I'm telling you, not all preachers, and I'm going to even – profess to say most teachers and most preachers are not wise. They may, they may know the scripture, but they don't have discernment. And finding someone who is gifted with Christian discernment that can pick out which way to go is a gift from God, and that is the word of God. And then lastly, God speaking audibly. And I put a question mark here because God has never, I've never heard the voice of God. And I know that there's, there's a concept called cessationist. And, and what that means is, um, that means that's people who do not believe that miracles occur anymore, that there is no speaking of tongues. Um, they go to the love. 1 Corinthians 13, they go to the love chapter, and they said, as for tongues, they will cease. And they point to those things and say that all of that since the apostolic age has passed away. Um, but they don't point to God speaking audibly. God, God is God. He can speak audibly to people, and I don't doubt I don't doubt that he does. He's never spoken to me, but I'm going to bet if I ask people to raise their hands and don't do it because people will think you're crazy. <laughs> I'm going to bet that people have heard the audible voice of an angel or of God. And I, I just, I don't doubt that that happens. It's just never happened to me. So God can speak in all of these ways. And, and in some ways he just screams this is the way that you're supposed to go. And so um, I do believe that God is working in your heart to speak to you and that we are supposed to be in total tune with, with God at all points in time. At the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Shephirah, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerem. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. 
And the leader said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. So they're at Gilgal, and all of a sudden they hear, these guys are right here 12 miles from us, that we were, we were totally duped. And so they head out. They head out to that direction. Let's go down to the map of Kiriath Jerim. This is another actual place right beside Gilgal, and there are, there are digs going on right there. The one thing that's uh, interesting about this, and um, at some point the Philistines raided Shiloh and they stole the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, and they take the Ark of the Covenant back to their place. They put it in their own sanctuary and their god every night falls down and then they start getting tumors all the philistines are getting tumors because they've taken this ark and the philistine priests say okay we got to get this out of here let's let's get this gone this is not good for us and they end up taking the ark and they take it to this place and they put it in a place called Abinad or a house of a, a guy named Abinadab. The Philistines lived in the Gaza Strip, exactly where all of these bombs came in. The Philist when you look at Philistines, that's Gaza Strip. That's exactly the curse that was going on, and that's exactly when they took the ark right here. That's a, a diversion. But um, so they come, and they say, takes three days. By the way, Gilgal is, the elevation of Gilgal is like minus 800 feet. It's below sea level. And Gibeon is... 2400 so the, it takes three days to go 12 miles because they're going up all of this all of this uh, terrain and they come there and they're like why did you lie to us what what gives and the people start murmuring against the leaders and the leaders are like no we we promised we made a covenant. I don't care if he is a skull, brother. We made a covenant. We can't break that. And so they treat them exactly as if, exactly as if they had been from a distant land. They honored their covenant. And they didn't kill them, and they made them servants for the altar of the Lord. Now, it's not clear whether they were cutters of wood and haulers of water for all of the congregation or just for just for the altar or the people. So let's go down to Israel, uh, 2 Samuel 21. There's a great question among scholars about whether the Gibeonites were actually converted, whether they had, um, whether they had become servants of Yahweh. At the start, it's clear that they weren't. They were. They didn't proclaim like Rahab that they were turning to Yahweh. But God was going to honor this promise in Second Samuel twenty-one. Now there was a famine in the days of David, so David is roughly. The, the story of Joshua is 1400 BC. The story of David is 1000 to 900 BC. So 400 years later. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now, the Gibeonites were not the people of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. And although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul sought to strike them down. And David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement? 
that you shall bless. David basically said, we made a covenant and we are going to honor it. We're going to honor it. Saul violated the covenant and we are going to honor it. So you go to a used car dealer and um, he puts out falsehood and you sign a contract. Are you supposed to honor that? Are we supposed to honor deception? When we make a contract, when we do something, are we supposed to honor someone that deceives us? No. Um, so when Carolyn, when I duped her, and I was a, a dipper, a prolific dipper, and um, when I promised her I would quit dipping, and I quit dipping for 10 days, was she supposed to honor the covenant that she'd made? Yes, that is a life bonding covenant. She should have done her due diligence. She should have known. She should have known that, but you don't, you don't break that. Let's assume that she did break that covenant. Let's assume that she said, Okay, well, you dupe me. You're a tobacco chewer. I don't like tobacco juice. I don't like any of any of this. I don't like spit cups around here. So I'm going to divorce you. She would have been wrong. Let's assume. So that's not a scriptural divorce in terms of in terms of the causes that you can put your husband away. That that actually doesn't qualify in the Bible. And so she's supposed to remain single. Let's assume that she's like, no, I don't really, I, I need a man. And she gets remarried. So is she supposed to, when she, when she eventually comes to the Bible, is she supposed to go divorce? Because she now realizes that that was not a scriptural divorce? No, that's a covenant. She has made a covenant. And what she should do in that case, and God forbid she ever does this and divorce me and marry somebody else, she should say, forgive me, and I'm going to do everything in this marriage to honor you. I mean, God hates divorce. He hates divorce. And even if you get remarried and it's not even in a scriptural context, then you stick with that and you honor God. Does that mean that we are supposed to do something that's immoral, an immoral covenant. Do So, all right, I hate my wife. I make a covenant with you to go kill her. No, you don't honor that. That's a bad covenant. She'll get you, first of all. First of all, women will win. But no, you don't honor an immoral covenant. So, if she really, God forbid divorce me because of my tobacco habits years ago and gets married to a woman, is she supposed to honor that covenant? No, that's immoral. We don't honor immoral covenants, but when we make a covenant, a covenant is important. It's not a contract. It's not a used contract deal. When you make a covenant with your son, your children, your wife, when you make a covenant, then you honor your word. We are Christians or people of their word, and our word should always be paramount. So that was more preaching than teaching. Any uh, questions? Scott, that's a great point. So for those in Zoom land, the, uh, Scott makes a distinction between a contract that has contractual outs and a covenant which you honor regardless of what happens. The Gibeonites, again, I said, had, there's, there's scholars that debate whether they converted or not. And I, although I'm not a scholar, I'm a dipper, and I, I believe that they actually converted. When Nehemiah came back, so... Israel falls, they, they will learn through Joshua, they continue to mess up all the way through. And uh, northern Israel falls, 10 tribes fall, they're, they 
fall to the Assyrians. They're assimilated into the Assyrians. And then ultimately, the south, Judah, falls in 586 BC, and they're hauled off to Babylon. And they're there for 70 years. And then God calls them to come back and rebuild the temple. Um, Ezra rebuilds the temple, and then Nehemiah comes in, and Nehemiah is called to, to build the walls because there are people all in Israel, as there is today, who, are, uh, who have animosity towards the Jews. And the people, several of the people that came back were Gibeonites that built the wall as the Bible talks about having a sword in one hand and building the wall with the other hand, and the Gibeonites were there building the wall. And so the covenant that Scott talks about is a covenant, and hopefully when you honor your covenant, eventually there is conversion. Eventually people come to Christ. Okay, one more announcement, Doug. You have some, some slides to show up there. Okay. Uh, how many have gotten the email that Russell reviewed? We've all reviewed it, and we sent this out to you in an email with uh, our life group uh, directory. Everybody, how many has gotten that email? Okay. How many have kind of saved that onto a file under their phone? Okay. Even less. Okay. I want to encourage you to do that because when you, when you go to access that file, you're going to forget that you got an email, you know, six weeks ago or something. So, uh, that's what it looks like. It's just updated August, uh, 2023. Uh, th that's one of the things I think that's page four on there kind of, uh, outlines all of our, uh, leadership ministries for our class. There's the rest of it there. We've just added the Creek 55 ministry there at the bottom. I don't know why you did that, Doug. I can't trust you to do anything. You know, I should have thought about this yesterday when I asked you to do this. So, so click off of that. And, uh, but the easiest way that I have found is when you're when you're pulling this this email up uh, down there, you'll you'll see the 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 little icon that that has a little arrow going through a square that you can save these to uh, iBooks is what I what, which I've done. Don, is that what you would recommend? Is the easiest way just to to save the file to iBooks and then you can always find it on your phone really quickly. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and let's be remembering the, uh, uh, Israel for sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, uh, we just know that there's some uh, some burning hearts and uh, some troubled minds, and just a lot going on right now in Israel. Lord, we just uh, lift up uh, the safety of the missionaries that are over there, and uh, just continue to to give wisdom and guidance and peace. And uh, protect everybody that uh, uh, maybe it has has trips scheduled to go there. That uh, Lord, you step in and give good wisdom and guidance uh, uh, in that in that time as well. Uh, just thank you for all the other prayer requests this morning, dear Lord. That uh, that you do care for for this church. I thank you for the guidance and the protection and the history that has gone before us and just pray lord that we will step out and uh, lead strongly in these days ahead in christ's name i pray amen all right y'all have a great week